Why? <laughs> Why would I travel 11,000 miles, endure over 30 hours of travel just to get to Christ Church New Zealand where it was our staging point? We weren't even going to Antarctica. Why would I do that? Why would I leave <laughs> this cute face weeks before my first Christmas as a father and my comfy OAR concert t-shirt? Why would I do that and trade it in for this? Now, everyone would have their own reasons why they would or wouldn't do it, but adventure, exploration, these are things that are ingrained in the human psyche. I mean, you can talk to any of my three kids, and one of their favorite questions is why. You know, why, why is the sky blue? But as you get to become an adult, you wonder, what's over that next ridge? What's over that next hill? Why are, what are some of the answers to the deeper questions that we have? So the reason why I was down in Antarctica, because by trade, I'm an engineer. I'm not a trained photographer. These pictures were taken with just a first generation Nikon digital SLR camera with the lens right out of the box. So how did an engineer from Delaware find up, wind up down in Antarctica? And no, it wasn't because my boss was so mad at me. He said, what's the furthest I could send John away? <laughs> he even gave me a return flight home ticket, so it wasn't because of that. We were down there working on a program in 2008 that was a joint mission between NASA and the National Science Foundation. Now, the National Science Foundation is the group that runs the Antarctic program down in McMurdo Station, which is where we were at. And the company I work for, ILC Dover, right up the road in Frederica, we make the spacesuit for NASA. So any pictures you've seen from the Apollo era on the 1960s all the way up through today, those spacesuits on the moon, outside the space shuttle, fetching a satellite, outside the International Space Station, they've been made right up the road here. So our company specializes in solving some of the world's hardest problems with fabric. And the problem we were solving that we got into cahoots with these guys with down in Antarctica was NASA, whenever we go back to the moon or hopefully to Mars at some point, we're going to need something for the astronauts to live in. They're not going to be able to live in the little tin cans that we had them on the moon for a few days during the Apollo years. They're going to need a bigger habitat to live in. And our rockets aren't going to be getting any bigger. They're not going to make bigger rockets to stuff stuff into. So the other way to handle that is you make something for the astronauts to live in that can fold up, and you do that with fabrics. And then when it gets up there, it inflates. The astronauts have the air to breathe, and it provides the structure to withstand the winds. <coughs> Hopefully it does a better job than Matt Damon's uh, <laughs> you know, building that he was in, and the structure's up there. So that's why NASA was interested in these inflatable habitats, and they came to us to solve some of the, those engineering challenges. Now, the National Science Foundation got on board with this for the Antarctic program because during the winter months, it takes about 200 to 250 people to keep the base running down there. But in the short window of summer that they have, which goes from about uh, mid to late fall through probably about right now, that population swells from like 200 people to well over 1,000 people. And those are the scientists coming down there to do the research because Antarctica is a very unique place. First of all, it's one of the few places that we haven't screwed up on the planet, so yeah. it's a very pristine, yeah, 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 I know, right? So it's a very pristine environment where we can start learning about not only our Earth's history because it's so pristine, but we can learn about the stars and space from there too, because meteorites fall all over the planet Earth, but on Antarctica, it's much easier to find them against that stark white background. Mm -hmm. Much easier than you can imagine finding a meteorite in some rainforest in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So that's why scientists go down there and that population swells. Well, when these scientists go down there, they have to go out into the field a lot of times. And when they go out into the field to withstand the harsh environment, even though it's during their summer months down there, they still have to withstand biting winds, extreme cold, and just very, very austere environments. So they send teams of carpenters out ahead of the scientists, probably a few, few person teams, and it takes them a couple days to build a structure out in the field to house these scientists for these long duration deployments out in the field. And the National Science Foundation talked to NASA and said, hey, 
wouldn't it be awesome if we could have a structure that could just get flown over the research site, kicked out of the plane, <laughs> fall down on the ground, not get destroyed, and when the team shows up, they fire up their generator and it inflates just like a kid's bouncy house, and now they have somewhere to live that will protect them from the environment. And that was the technical challenge that ILC was tasked with. And that was the challenge that we rose to. In six months, we took it from conception all the way through the design phase, build, shipment, and deployment in Antarctica in less than six, seven months. And this is me standing in front of the habitat. It looks like a normal building like, you're, like you see in the you know, war movies, that, that Quonset Hut style. But this is after 11 months in Antarctica, withstanding an Antarctic winter. And it was no worse for wear. And my job was to go down there and do an inspection after the winter, see how well everything did, uh, see if there were any issues, you know, j just learn whatever we could from this. Because NASA and the National Science Foundation were, were really looking to use technology like this. And I'm, I'm pleased to report that it looked perfect after 11 months down there. So much so, we were almost ready to take it out into the field, load it up on a chopper on the back of a snowmobile and take it out. Uh, but we got orders changed that this actually got shipped back to Delaware because it was supposed to go to the North Pole for another expedition. <laughs> but unfortunately, it only made as far north as Frederica. Um, <laughs> 2008, 2009 wasn't a real good year financially for, uh, for a lot of things, and the funding fell through. So, but I was down there to check this thing out, and everything did well. And there's no structure in here. There's no two by fours, no wood, no fiberglass. It was just held up with air. Wow. So this is inside of it, and you can't you can see some of the air beams that are here, but the whole structure was 19 inch diameter air beams that were inflated by a little teeny tiny pump that fit inside mm -hmm. that box over in the corner there. It's about this big. Wow. It had been inflated all through the winter, you know, sub zero temperatures, 24 hours of dark, gritty soil <laughs> being thrown at it by the harsh winds down there. And was it made out of Kevlar? This was actually made out of a material that is very similar to what they make Zodiac boats out of. They see the inflatable boats that you see uh, like Navy SEALs zipping around in or they have hanging off the, the ferry. So it was material like that, but we had to do a lot of testing to qualify it because when we called them and told them what we wanted to do, they said, yeah, we don't have any data <laughs> on that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, but that's why, that, that's where I came in. You know, we worked with the design engineers to make sure everything was strong enough and it would handle the temperatures and the cycles. But we had to think, think everything, think big picture, you know, <coughs> lunar exploration. Uh, NASA hates fire. They really don't like it. So this, the reason why you can't see the air beams under here, this fabric that's up there, that, that's a flame retardant fabric. Again, we're, we're not only working to have this thing remotely deployed in Antarctica, but also looking big picture for, for exploration. Mm -hmm. So that's how I found myself halfway across the world weeks before Christmas. Mm -hmm. yes. What's the inflator powered by? This was powered just by, um, we had power tapped into the base because we were at the main oh, okay. base. But yeah, it was just electric, but if you're out in the field, um, they don't have extension cords that long. <laughs> so we'd have to have a generator or something out there, but it'd be able to be run by just a standard generator. And that was, that's, a, that's a great point. Obviously, very conscious of power budgets. You know, you can't have some big honking fan out there inflating this thing. Everything had to be real small, so that meant we had to build things very leak tight while we were there, and we had to have a good understanding of all that, so it could run off a small generator. Are they pieces stitched together? How are they? How are they actually put together? So the way we did this, this structure was a bit unique. It's something called heat sealing. Mm. Uh, a, a real good example to give you a visual of that is when you get that awesome bag of hers barbecue potato <laughs> chips <laughs> home, you, you, the ends are, are sealed together. That's done with heat sealing where they just use heat and pressure to actually melt the material together. Well, we were able to do that with this material too because of the coating that holds the air in, it melts and that's a whole, whole other set of engineering that we have to do to figure out how long, how hot, how much pressure, what's the cool down have to be, so there's a lot to go into it. Yeah. Uh, could you use uh, like uh, solar panels to run the generator if it's like in Antarctica and it's going to be there for a while? Yeah, so, so the good part about when this would be deployed uh, and it would be inhabited would be there's 24 hours of sunlight right. down there. Um, and that would be, have to be something that we'd have to figure out what a power budget would be with, with solar panels, but absolutely, that'd be something. Yes? 
Um, <clears throat> once you inflated it, how much did you have to do to keep it inflated? Did you have to run it intermittently or? Yeah, great question. So inside this box, this is the this is the brains of the operation in here. So it not only had the little inflator, which it did not run all the time, it had pressure switches that were in there and it would say pressure would get low enough and it would kick the pump on and once it would hit the high point it would turn back off. Like a thermostat except for it, pressure. Great example, yeah, <laughs> thermostat. Wish I had thought of that one. So I'll call <laughs> that for the, uh, for the Rev A presentation. Thank you. Um, but that, that's a great question. This is one of those things that you get into once you get into a project with engineering where things come up that you, you, you just never would have thought of. So we were measuring the pressure inside of this. Well, the pressure inside of this is only part of the story. You have to know what the pressure is outside of it. Hmm. Not a big deal here in Delaware. You know, the atmospheric pressure changes a little bit. But down in Antarctica, they get such severe weather patterns that the, we, and we looked at the historical weather data, they can get pressure swings down there in less than 24 hours that are way more severe than the atmospheric pressure changes we have from hurricanes up here. So if that were the case and the atmospheric pressure were to drop real low outside real quick and this thing was inflated high, you could possibly blow the thing, explode the thing. So we'd have pressure relief valves all through there in case that happened and have a smart enough system to accommodate all that. So the fluctuations are not from leaks, but just from the... Uh, Pressure. Well, there, there are leaks. Um, as, as much as we try, everything leaks. There's no perfect system. Like even the spacesuit that we have, the manned spacesuit, we have allowable leakage. Or we're allowed to hit on that. Um, so, but that's part of the testing that we did before at Wet Antarctica. We, we made sure we were below a leakage threshold, and that was tied back to the power budgets with everything. Yes, the man being very patient in the back. Yeah. Uh, is this material uh, resistant to static electricity, or do you have to do anything to? Because it must be really dry up there, and this is some kind of plastic. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if you would have rubbed a balloon on it, it, it would have made your hair stand up. Um, but that would be a very big concern in space, especially if they're running with an enriched oxygen environment. In the spacesuit that we make, that's a huge concern because they breathe 100% oxygen in the spacesuit. So all the material in there, it can't create any static electricity because if it does, it's going to go boom, and that's a, that's a bad day. But, but this material here was done real quick, um, but on mission, static electricity would be a big deal because not only explosions, but electronics too. Yes? Uh, is the structure anchored? Yeah, great question. Let me, uh, let me back up here. Because the winds that we do have, and we did an analysis of the winds hitting this shape, uh, we said, yeah, this thing will actually take off, which would be bad. So, <laughs> so we, we have numerous anchors here. But even these anchors that they set down in the rock, because the soil down there, it's, it's crushed volcanic rock. And underneath all the, all the mud is just a, a rock base under there. Or if you're out in the field, it's going to be a big ice, you know, depth of ice. But that's a lot easier to do. You could have someone generally that's pretty bad at construction, like me, um, use, some, use just a rock drill and put it down in prescribed locations and just drive an anchor into the ground with a hammer and a wrench. So there are a bunch of, of guy lines, and we went overkill on it because no one's going to know if you put too many, but they're really going to know if you didn't put enough <laughs> when this thing launches across the McMurdo Sound during the winter time. That would be bad. Yeah, yeah you don't, don't want to do that. All right, so there's the inside. So. That's why I was down there. Let's talk about getting down there and the experience of being down there, the journey. As I said, it was 30 hours just to get to Christchurch, New Zealand, which is where we were staging from. And believe it or not, US Air doesn't have a connecting flight to Antarctica. So what we had to get on, we, we were able to fly down on a relatively nice plane. Um, <laughs> these are deluxe accommodations. The US Air Force was kind enough to give us a ride. So we were on a C-17 and they were they had a full cargo load out here. They were dropping us off at McMurdo Station which is about a five to six hour flight from Christchurch, New Zealand. And then after they dropped us off on the ice, after they let us off the airplane and stopped, they were... <laughs> <laughs> You never know. <laughs> they were actually taking back off, and they were flying another few hours south to the South Pole and doing an airdrop. 
because the South Pole Station doesn't have an airfield that can handle an aircraft this big. So mm -hmm. to resupply them, they just fly over them, and uh, once they get over the drop zone, open the doors, and everything comes zipping out. So my deluxe accommodations were in front of a, a metal sea container, and then over to my left was a giant orange, um, scary-looking tank, I think, of liquid oxygen. So <laughs> yeah, if, if this goes bad, it's, it's, I'm not going to know for very long. But yeah, about nine hours inside this cavernous aircraft. And you know, the aircraft's an awesome aircraft. It's what they fly out of the base primarily here in Dover. But it's built to get in some of the most hostile regions on the planet. So not necessarily a creature conference. Like our seats were just, you know, a little metal frame with webbing on it that you sat on. So inside this airframe or this aircraft for five to six hours wearing all of our full cold weather gear, which let me tell you, going through security, wearing 20 pounds of cold weather gear, that's an experience. <laughs> because once you go through security, and you have to wear your weather gear in case you have to ditch. You're wearing your gear. Oh gosh. Yeah. So you're wearing all this gear. They load you up in the van to get to the transport jet in New Zealand in December, which is like oh, their June. Yeah, their <laughs> summer. Right. So you're just sitting there and sweltering, oh, wearing all your gear. So just just getting on the aircraft was a an experience. But during the trip, you're allowed to get up and walk around and you know hang out with the air crew and ask questions. We'd get glimpses of what we were about to see. And this is out of the, the little porthole windows that we had, about the size of a compact disc. Wow. Okay, yeah, everyone's you know old enough to know what a compact disc is. I didn't, I didn't, know, I didn't know what the uh, what the, the age is. Yeah, yeah, forty five. They weren't they weren't as big as the forty five. <laughs> but we get these glimpses out these little tiny portholes of just this landscape that we're getting ready that we were going to be landing on. That's just almost alien mm -hmm. and being up high is so cool you know you, you can see so many things and you know it wasn't that long ago before we could fly and people traversing this kind of landscape without the aircraft and satellite and all the information we have but, I mean you can see you know these ice flows that would be happening you know avalanches I mean just, just the point of view that you had from up high was so cool and this is one of my, my favorite shots this is another one obviously taken from Ariel, not only because of the landscape, but on the edges of the maps that you see, the old maps, you'd usually see written on the end, Terra Incognita, the unknown lands. And there'd be dragons usually out there. You know, <laughs> you know it's something yeah. scary. And this always reminded me of some giant dragon skeleton just kind of laying there. And I looked at the picture, I thought, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's kind of where, our, that's, that's where we we're going. We we're going beyond the edge of the map. So after all these hours of air travel, we finally land, and they pop the cargo doors, which <coughs> blinded me. This was my first view of Antarctica, which I'm glad the picture came out because I couldn't see a darn thing. Because my, eyes, my eyes were so burned out. But this is looking out the back of the out back out of the transport, and we all stood up and we had our gear and we we shuffled our way past the cargo containers. And I'm sure we all have memories <coughs> that you can close your eyes and you can just picture everything. The sight, the sounds, the smells, the taste, just the overall feeling. And that was one of the experiences that I had as soon as we stepped off the plane. You jumped off the last step and I can still see and hear my boots hit the ice and go <laughs> And just seeing this landscape past this aircraft wing was just so grand. I, I'd never seen anything so big in my life before. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of place that's just so big, it swallows every sound and it just has this sense of stillness mm -hmm. and peace and quiet. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it made you aware of every single sound that you were, that you were making. The crunching of my boots on the ice you know, how my backpack was shifting on my shoulders as I was walking, just even the sound of my breath, as I realized my, my heartbeat was increasing, just being like, holy cow, <laughs> I'm actually here. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I made it. Mm -hmm. And what was the temperature well, when you landed? It actually wasn't too bad when we landed. I mean, it was usually 
20 to 30 degrees, but the part that was... That's their summer. Yeah, that's their summer, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, bring out the bathing suits. <laughs> um, but w down there, the wind was just so biting. I mean, we think we have it bad here in Delaware. I mean, it was, it was really bad here, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the experiences I had thanks to the, thanks to the wind down there. But we were still on the airfield here, and before we, we motored off to the main base, I was looking out at the landscape, and you see this giant mountain here. And it's shrouded in clouds. And then I started realizing that there was a, a cloud hanging close to the top. But the cloud looked like it was vertical. So I said to someone, I said, hey, what's going on with that mountain? They said, oh, oh, that's Mount Erebus. That's an active volcano. It must be getting ready to do something. <laughs> <laughs> Say, what? <laughs> so right away, I had to totally recalibrate myself. Like, got it. Not in Delaware. Not in Delaware anymore. Yeah, there's mountains, first of all. And holy cow, they're smoking and could launch something the size of a Volkswagen at me. But we were standing on an ice runway field. We were on the Pegasus white ice runway field. And you, you just land right on the ice down there. There's no paved tarmacs. You just, they just put the aircraft right down on it. And the seats we were in when we were flying down being that they were on the side of the aircraft, and I didn't think about this until they throttled up. On a normal craft, when you throttle up, you get pushed back in the seat. Well, this, you just kind of go over like a bunch of ping pong balls. And then when you land and they hit the brakes on the ice, you go the other way, and now you're friends with the person on the right of you. So it was a totally different experience. But just to get from the airfield to the main base was about a 45 minute drive on a on a huge what they call Ivan the Terror bus. It has its own Facebook page. You can look <laughs> it up. This is just this giant bus that's a, a three axle and just big transport. The tires on it, I think there's a picture of me sitting next to it. It's like up over my shoulder. So everything down there is big and just otherworldly down there. So where we were at, we were at the McMurdo Station. And McMurdo Station started uh, it was constructed in the 1950s. It was a U.S. naval base. And what it was, it was, it's the main staging area for all of our expeditions that go into the interior of Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we were almost at the South Pole. We were at latitude 77 south. Um, but McMurdo Station's a, a huge place. The, the best description I heard of it was a, by a colleague of mine that was down there for the initial deployment was, it's kind of like a mining town crossed with a college campus. <laughs> and, you know, it, 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 it's very rugged, um, but there's obviously a lot of brilliant minds down there doing all this amazing science. So th there were such cool lectures going on, and it, it's hard to believe that this was able to be built just, you know, at the end of the earth. And there was a, a, obviously tons of interesting facts about McMurdo, but one of the things that was really neat was there actually used to be a live nuclear reactor down there that powered everything. Um, but they had a small problem with leaks. So, <laughs> so they decommissioned it and got everything out of there. And that brings up an interesting point down there. So we've had this base down there since the 1950s. And there, are, I, f I forget what it is now. I want to say it's like 30 or 50 countries have territories that they've claimed on Antarctica. But no one owns Antarctica. There's no laws down there. You're kind of under the law of whatever country of the place you're in. But no one recognizes each other's claims. So I didn't really understand it, and I still don't. But I made the promise to myself that I was not going to speak to the US Marshal that we keep on site. And, uh, Mission accomplished on that one, so. <laughs> so glad to hear that. But this is what it looked like just walking around. Uh, it wasn't real big. That's actually Ivan back there. Ivan the terror bus parked there for the for the evening. But just walking around, there's no paved roads. Everything's just dirty, muddy. And speaking of dirt, this is what it looked like. This is where our working conditions because the snowpack had melted around where we were, being in the summer. But all of the, there's no plant life in Antarctica. There's nothing indigenous down there growing. So they don't have soil like we have where it's decayed and you know, dirt. It shows straight up pulverized lava rock. So you can think of it as sand with an attitude. <laughs> it's a, being a photographer, it created a lot of unique challenges uh, just to keep my gear intact during the entire time that we were down there. So I'd have to have a lot of forethought 
you know, what lens do I want to use? Or if I had to change a lens, really shield my camera from what was going on down there. And something that happened that really made me learn to think on my feet was the area around the image sensor that I had on this trip of a lifetime started disintegrating that I realized. I was looking at these pictures of this bright blue sky and this pristine white background and there's these little black flecks and I thought, oh, I must have just gotten some grit in there. No, the image, the area around the image sensor was just totally disintegrating. So I had to quickly realize, all right, I can either put my camera away, which that wasn't going to happen, or I can figure out a way to have a solution on this. And one of the things I would do would be I'd try to set my shots up once I figured out where the worst of the, the crud, for lack of a better term, was on my sensor, set it up so it was over a rock or, or something where it'd be able to kind of be buried in the shot. Hmm. And then if I wasn't able to do that, I thank the good folks at Adobe. So I could, <laughs> so I could just yeah. go in there and, and, uh, and, and clone it out of there. But so, what was life like, you know, day to day at the end at the end of the earth? This is our this is our home away from home during the week we were down there. So we were only down there for a week, which is crazy to think about traveling all that way. We were down there for a week. They wanted us in and out. Um, but this was our home away from home when we weren't working. It's building 155, the personnel building, and in there we had phone, internet, all you can eat cafeteria. <laughs> this was our room. Uh, I got bunked up with I think four four or five other guys. So it pretty much looks like my room in college. You know, there's clothes everywhere. Uh, the bed's not made. There's a case of beer there. So pretty much all that's missing is the kiss posters. You know, <laughs> that were there in college. But it, overall, it was, it was it was very amenable down there. Um, everyone was on the four day a week shower schedule. So everyone's kind of used to a little funk going on there. So, but it was it was overall it it really was not bad accommodations. You know, when you figure out where you actually were. So that was life on the base. What about getting out there? Now we were working 10 to 12 hour days while we were down there just to get the job done in that, that short seven day window. But it was 24 hours of sunlight. We thought, what are we going to do with our time? We're certainly not gonna squander it watching you know, DVDs of Friends or something <laughs> like that. So we went out. We went out exploring. But we were rewarded with views like this. This is overlooking the McMurdo Sound, which comes right up to the Antarctic coastline here. And the, just the grandeur of everything that's down there was just so enormous. These are called pressure ridges, which, which I'll discuss in more detail on one of our other excursions that we went out on. But I just love the, the color that you can see the, the water trying to break through that ice air as it's just pummeling up against, getting pummeled up against the, the coast. You know, I would have loved to have been there whenever this snow, you know, snowpack just let loose down there and just come roaring down. This is the George T. Vince Memorial. He was has the unfortunate designation of being the first person to fall through the ice and die okay. on Antarctica. He was a member of Robert Falcon Scott's ill-fated New Zealand expedition that attempted to reach the South Pole unsuccessfully. But this cross has been standing for well over a hundred years, right on the coast of the McMurdo Sound, just getting beat up by the wind and the weather and the grit, just pummeling it. But that just it's, it just gives such a sense of uh, just bigness down there. I mean, the fact that these are probably large track vehicle tires, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's incomprehensible how big everything was. And when you turn around to the left, uh, you see this. This is Our Lady of the Snows, uh, affectionately referred to as Roll Cage Mary. Um, <laughs> well, you, get, you have to have a sense of humor when you're this far away from home and it's in situations like this. Say that name again. Yeah, um, roll, ca roll cage Mary. Yeah, because this looks like a roll cage of like off-road truck. <laughs> I didn't say this was going to be a reverent presentation, so I apologize. But what this is, this was a memorial to a U.S. Navy CB, the, the the construction crew that was of the U.S. Navy, and he <coughs> fell through the ice while they were building the the McMurdo Station back in the 1950s and. You get, there's a you know there's all sorts of trinkets and rosaries and there's actually a CB patch that was right there. Hmm. So I'm putting these pictures up on Facebook and sending them home to everyone. And uh, my wife says to me after seeing a couple of them, "Hey, 
I'm seeing a lot of like memorials for dead people now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Will you, will you try to be careful while you're down there, please, and come home for Christmas? So I said, all right, that sounds like a good idea. I'm, I'm on board with that. But I mean, even just something like this is is just beautiful. I mean, you can you can see the the lava rocks piled up down there. So. After seeing these memorials right there at uh, Scott's Discovery Point uh, for these gentlemen who fell through the ice, my roommate Garrett and I naturally thought the good thing to do would be hike three miles down to the New Zealand Scott base and walk back to McMurdo on the ice, mm -hmm. on the Cape Armitage uh, Pressure Ridge Trail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here's some here's some scale out there so what the trail is it, it takes you from the New Zealand base around Cape Armitage all the way being walking on the McMurdo over top of the McMurdo Sound hope you're not in it um, but, but they had flags marked as, as safe um, as safe patches down there because you have to remember it was summer and the ice was kind of melting mm -hmm. down there so I mentioned pressure ridges before and this whole trail most of it at least for the first half of it were these pressure ridges. And what they are, it's when the surface winds come across the frozen sea and there's still currents underneath because the ocean's not totally frozen underneath. And the winds and the waves conspire, much like tectonic plates, to hit the ice cracks together and heave it up into the air. And this is the result of it. it it's, it's much like the way mountain ranges are formed. Another thing that you can see here is it has this blue tint to it. And um, the, this actually this is salt water. Yeah. What this what this is, and you s might have seen blue ice from Antarctic pictures before. Is this ice gets so cold and it, it doesn't, and it gets so compressed just because it's under such constant load, it squeezes the air bubbles out. Because when you look at this this ice up here, sure it's ice and it's snow, and uh, if someone threw a snowball of it at me, it would hurt. But there's air bubbles in it, little microscopic air bubbles. And when the light hits it, it changes the way the light bounces around. So this stuff down here is just pure, dense, no frills, no air ice. It's just a very dense ice. So when you see the blue ice, that's what that is. It's very, usually very old, like glacial ice that's had that time to just be compressed and have the air squeezed right out of it. And are those icicles from it? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure what the icicles were all about on that there it, it probably was just maybe when it came up if it was wet during a pressure heave uh, it could have just melted in the sun because the sun was warm it would melt the snow but yeah i don't know why there were icicles but probably due to the, the snow melting and now i wish i had this picture of my roommate in there that didn't make the final cut he was holding an icicle at one point that yeah. when he broke it off of a, yeah. of a um a cornice that had blown over I think it was like this big. He's just standing there like someone from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's a giant icicle. Did so. wow. it ever get above freezing the entire time you were there? When we were there, um, I'm not sure if the air temperature did, but certainly the induced temperature did. The, the, the temperature that would be with the solar radiation hitting us. Because uh, we had special sensors on our habitat. Those were some of the things that we were measuring. And I forget, I think the induced temperature might have hit in the 40 degree range, mm -hmm. 42, 45, 6 in my head. Yeah. But the air temperature, I think, was usually hovering around 20 to 30. Oh, yeah, so so there were some days where we were, if we were doing real physical stuff, like because we had sensors buried in the ground, um, I would have loved to have gotten a hold of the scientists that said that was a great idea <laughs> to bury sensors in the mud mm -hmm. and then dig them up 12 months later. Mm -hmm. um, but like on those kind of days, we were out there just in, in t-shirts, wow. you know, and work pants working. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't too bad because McMurdo was stationed or shrouded by the mountain ranges around it from the wind. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't too bad down in the base. You just had the sun beating down on you. But once you start getting out away from the base, it, it got a, a little bit do dodgier with the, with the amount of wind coming at us. Mm -hmm. So the entire time we were in Antarctica, I wanted to see a penguin. <laughs> I didn't get to see a penguin. But we saw traces of penguins, so we it off as a partial win. Um, you can see the little penguin tracks here, and this is out on the, on the Pressure Ridge Trail. And the best we could figure out with this kind of dished out shape and these little dots beside it 
where some penguin was playing and actually was sliding on its belly <laughs> and was pushing with the flippers because there were there were tracks all over the place, but uh, the little boogers were quite elusive and we didn't we didn't get to see any of them. But we couldn't be too mad. I mean, because we yeah. got to see stuff like this yeah. for miles and miles of the hike. But yeah, you, you brought up the the icicles and you know that I, I like to think about stuff like too. Like, what what caused that? Like, what, what caused that little hole up there? I mean, there's no woodpeckers down here. Yeah. I don't know if like a narwhal came up and you know poked through it, but yeah, you know, just just getting out there and seeing what's out there was, was just so much fun. It's a meteorite. Yeah, maybe yeah, bullseye. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, got stuck with his beak. So we've seen a lot of like big grand pictures and certainly Antarctica is a land of just very grandiose big stuff. But one one of the photo seminars I attended uh when I first got my camera, Nikon gave me a ticket to see Sam Garcia, who was one of their photographers talk. And this is back when I didn't know what difference between an aperture and a shutter speed was. He said, you can make anything interesting when you get up close. <laughs> so we've seen these big icebergs and crosses and monuments that scared my wife. Um, <laughs> my roommate Garrett saw this in a, in a crevasse while we were out hiking. And these are just little tiny ice crystals about the size of my pinky. And it just goes to show that always be on the lookout for stuff and kind of change your point of view. You know, we had to get lay down on our bellies and probably get a little too close to a crack in the ice and maybe we should have been. <laughs> um, maybe we should have switched to a long lens on that. But, you know, don't be afraid to change your point of view. You know, some of, if you look back at some of the pictures, especially this is true with taking pictures of children, some of the pictures that are probably your favorite or the most natural looking are when you get down at their level and take a picture instead of taking a picture towering above them. Um, so make sure to change your point of view, not just with photography, but whatever whatever you're doing. Try to try to get a different spin on it. And this is just a, another another view on the uh, on the Pressure Ridge Trail. And here you can actually see some of the flags that were marking the safe passage area. And I just remember walking through here, and it was just a sea or a forest of just ice above us. Yeah, you know, just these jagged pieces of, of ice and rock, or not rock, but just sharp sharp spires just going up and you're just kind of walking through i felt like buddy the elf you know walking out of the north pole so it's just very grand down there Pick another picture of mount Erebus, who was kind enough not to be smoking today while i was out walking out over the ic but i can remember thinking as we were doing this big loop because i think it, at the end of the day i think we ended up going like seven to nine miles in a hike. I just remember getting halfway through this, you're out on over top of the water and there's just nothing ahead of you. And we we had hiked out of the main pressure ridges. So there's there was nothing really behind us. And I just remember being so tired. And all I all I wanted to do was just sit down and have someone come get me, but that totally wasn't gonna happen. So we just had to really just kind of pick ourselves up after we had a snack and, and just keep going. But I can just remember thinking, what have I gotten myself into <laughs> getting out over top of this? And that was one of the, the few times where my heart actually started racing. I started thinking, what, you know, what's going on? This, this could end up very badly here. But we persevered and, and just kind of kept talking to each other and just, just kept on moving. That's when you started thinking about the memorials. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, wonder, I hope they spell my name right, yeah. <laughs> so we decided we want to have our feet planted a little bit more firmly on, on the ground. So we took a hike after, uh, after work one day. And that was another thing my wife said to me. She said, hey, are you, are you working down there? There's just a lot of like, uh, pictures of you hiking and rock climbing down there. <laughs> and I said, well, look at the time stamp. I mean, we, we would go out after work at like 8 p.m. and be gone till 2 in the morning. Wow. You know, we'd get sandwiches or something from the dining hall and just kind of stuff them in our jackets <laughs> and just go just go waddling out there and, uh, you know, you go on the trail and then get back late. Wow. So we did an ascent of Castle Rock. It's a three-mile hike, about 1,300 elevation change, uh, with the bulk of that probably being the last few hundred feet of the actual rock that we had to free climb once we got out there. And this is the, the trail going up to it. You can trail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can see they had the bamboo stakes there with the flags uh, marking safe passage because 
This hike was actually one where they actually had very big crevasses because now we were getting up into the mountains while we were getting outside. And wind can blow, or weather can blow in real quick, and obviously it's real extreme down there. So they, they had two emergency shelters, um, creatively called apples. <laughs> <laughs> and inside of it, they had toolkits, food, sleeping bags, or I think there might have been a bunk or two suspended in there, uh, a notebook where people wrote um, irreverent things <laughs> in whatever their native language was. <laughs> but. Uh, it, it, it's a good testament to just, just how quickly that weather can change because that was one of the things they warned us about when we were flying down to Antarctica. They said, look, this weather could change while you're four hours into this flight and we're going to turn you around. That's how bad it gets. So what you would have to fly with was called your boomerang bag. And your boomerang bag was anything you would need because all your stuff was loaded on a pallet. It was all cargo strapped down. So your boomerang bag was anything you absolutely positively needed. You know, um, medicine, glasses, um, underwear, if you so chose. Uh, but that weather down there can change so quick, and it is so extreme. That's why they have to have some of these shelters around. Wow. So when we finally reached Castle Rock, we free climbed it. And we had some rock climbing back, some rock climbing experience. Um, that's actually the, the shoulder of Mount Erebus, the volcano over there. But we came up this, and then we got up onto the rocks, and we're, we're climbing that. And oh, this is looking back out over the, the McMurdo Sounds. Wow. And we, uh, after just getting pummeled by the wind, because once you get out of that main base where I said we were, we were sheltered, the wind would just come howling off the, off the uh, ice out here. It would start all the way over across on these mountain ranges across the sound, and they call them kidiabatic kid winds. <laughs> and... The weather gets so extreme, it, it actually starts to flip-flop the hot and cold air. And what it'll do is it'll actually start over here. And I believe some of the guys said you could hear it coming across and just plow into you. Now, fortunately, we didn't get hit with any of that. But we were hit with just, you know, just relentless winds the entire time during the climb. And uh, it was the kind of wind that could knock you off balance, which is bad when you're climbing. So we had to be, we had to be real careful while we were up there. But... Please report, mm. we made it. This is my other roommate, Scott, just looking back over the road that we, uh, that we came up here. Wow. That, was, that was right after we summited. How high up was it? You know? uh, the total elevation of that is 1,300 feet. Well, let me back up. Getting ahead of myself, yeah. So, part about being a photographer is, uh, especially when you're out in the field, is thinking on your feet. Also, like when you're presenting and go too fast on your slides. <laughs> So we got to the top and we realized we didn't have a tripod just because we didn't want to be lugging a tripod during this, this whole hike. So I said, well, I got my gorilla pod. So we, uh, we had my chin strap here in case it got blown off, but we were able to get a picture of our, uh, of our intrepid group here, you know, with hands raised <laughs> up on top of uh, Castle Rock while we were down here. And uh, if you look at me in the middle here, it looks like I have one of the big old school hats on <laughs> that I grew up wearing with the big uh, yarn ball at the top. But that was actually uh, that was actually my trusty trusty Nikon. Like a herd of uh, deer. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, right. Go pro when you don't have one. <laughs> this is before GoPros. Yeah, old school. It was real hard to get a selfie with this. Let me stay out. Yeah. Just right. <laughs> yeah. So this is the road home. Uh, we had a few mile hike back home. And again, you just get this just magnificent feelings of just desolation there. But uh, one of our astronauts really summed it up how I felt a lot of times here when we just be presented with this big stark landscape. Uh, magnificent desolation. I forget who the astronaut was that sent, said that, but that's what he described the moon as. And that's um, Buzz Aldrin. Okay. So Buzz Aldrin said, <laughs> no snowshoes or, or cross country skis? No, we didn't have anything. It was actually pretty hard packed snow because Antarctica is actually a desert. Huh. And the defining characteristic of a desert is getting below a certain level of precipitation a year. Hmm. And it actually doesn't snow a whole lot in Antarctica. Um, we're talking like inches a year. But when you get out in these anterior regions, especially down at the South Pole, it just doesn't melt. So a lot of it was very hard packed mm -hmm. snow. So we didn't really need snowshoes or cross country skis. We just had our, our issued uh, 
lovingly referred to as our Mickey Mouse boots. Mm-hmm. They're big white boots that had air insulation layers, and you kind of look like Mickey Mouse. So they might size nine elf feet look uh, yeah. <laughs> huge. But yeah, this is our this is our long road home. I put this picture in here because isn't it amazing how color changes your point of view? <coughs> exactly. It looks exactly like a desert. Take that blue sky out of it and any kind of blue tint and it looks just, just like a desert. So I thought that was real cool whenever whenever I did it. I think I actually did it by mistake. I turned it the black hit the black and white line. I thought, ah. Actually actually turned out but that goes back to changing your point of view of how you look at things and how something as um, simple is not the right word, but, but just doing something like changing the color or reducing the color can just totally change where it's from. Is that the moon up there? That is probably a cloud that's up there. The moon was, um, was about a half moon while we were down there. And it actually was there. The first night that we got there, after we did our in-process briefing, which was fun. That's where they told us such fun things as uh, about leopard seals, which are nicknamed the grizzlies of the Atlantic, oh. and uh, will bite you. Oh. Uh, so we didn't see any of those. Uh, but they also told us during that briefing that keep your head on straight and don't do anything foolish while you're down here because we can give you any kind of medical care that you can get in an ambulance. But if you need major medical care, Forget the best we're going to do is if there's a C-17 jet ready to go and there's room for you, we can maybe get you to a hospital in 18 to 24 hours. <laughs> so, but, you know, wow. so when I heard that, I thought, oh, uh-oh. <laughs> um, but it, it kind of really made sure that you kept your wherewithal about you and really thought things through and gave me a good feeling of this is what it used to be like. Mm-hmm. You know, before major medical, you had to really just kind of rely on your own wits and think things through and uh, try not to do anything too foolish while you're down there. So home. So I knew I was going to be gone for a couple weeks while I was down there, and we finally got our orders to go home, and there were two sets of orders that were going out. We were leaving mid-December. And there was one group that was getting on the U.S. Air Force sexy C-17 jet that went fast. And there's another group that they said, sorry about your luck, but if you want to get home before Christmas, the last transport out is on a C-130 propeller-driven airplane. And by the way, heads up, we're going into a headwind assuming we can take off. So I thought, oh, all right. Guess which one I was on. <laughs> And when we got there, when we pulled up on, on our land transport, we actually watched the C-17 jet take off into the sky. And we saw this little white C-130 sitting down on the runway down there with its doors open and a bunch of guys standing around like this, which being a test engineer, I know when you see a bunch of guys standing around like this, this isn't going to end well. So the next time you're stuck in an airport, <laughs> and you're delayed, but you have Starbucks or can take your coat off. I want you to remember this picture of me. <laughs> delayed on the runway in Antarctica. Where are you going? Because we were standing there. I, I was taking pictures earlier, so, so <laughs> occupational hazard. Standing here while we were waiting for our C-130 to get fixed. And like I said, this was mid-December. This is one of the last transports that was leaving before Christmas because they had a major weather system moving in. We had beautiful blue skies, even though it was windy for the week we were down there. But when we got off the tran- our, our ground transport and we're waiting for our aircraft, you can see there's no blue sky anymore. And if you see the other side, if I would have taken a picture of the other side, it was starting to get gray, <laughs> the kind where you actually kind of see the weather oh. in it. And it was far off at this point, but it was starting to look real dicey. So. They eventually got the plane fixed after it had sat there with all the doors open for hours in Antarctica. And this was uh, this is what it looked like going home. Yeah, everyone in your yeah first class. Yeah, so they were kind enough to put seats in it, but yeah, I'm not a big guy. I don't ask for much legroom. I never complain when I'm flying, but. This was horrible. <laughs> we actually sat down, and, and you had to have your go bag with you. 
and you're in all your gear, and so obviously so is everyone else. I couldn't even put my feet down mm -hmm. on the floor. That's how close the seats were wow. jammed back in. Oh my goodness. And we no sooner got on the aircraft and they pulled the wheel chocks, shut the doors and started moving so we could get off the ground. Mm -hmm. And this dude gets up there in a blue flight suit. He's like a six foot six South African guy. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna subject you to my horrible accent. <laughs> he got up there. He goes, "All right, look, listen up, everyone. We're moving. We're rolling out now. This is a seatbelt. You should all know how to use one." And just kind of tossed it to the side. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be good. Because I'd just gotten on my, on an aircraft in a ski mask, and I thought this is the last time I'd be able to get on an aircraft in a ski mask. <laughs> he said. All right, if you hear me yell, brace, 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 we're going to crash. You better brace so you don't die. <laughs> he goes, if we crash and you are still alive, you are to listen to my directions. <laughs> if I am dead, look for someone else in a blue flight suit. And meanwhile, we're just bouncing kind of down, back and head off. All right. He says, if I am dead, listen to someone else in a blue flight suit. If they are all dead, you must get off the aircraft. <laughs> And to, to sum it all up, he says, we do have a uh, lavatory here on this flight. Uh, you'll probably need to use it. We're expecting it to be between 9 and 11 hours into the headwind. And uh, the, the restroom is right up here. Uh, you have to pull the shower curtain aside. And uh, hopefully the people in the front row are kind enough to pull their feet back to give you some privacy. <laughs> if there are any ladies on this flight, I'm very sorry <laughs> for the lack of privacy. So that was my, uh, one of my last experiences in Antarctica, and I thought, well, these guys aren't very safety-minded. So what I did after we took off successfully, because I'll tell you what, if I would have been stuck down there for Christmas and missed my first child's first Christmas, I was just going to stay down there. I <laughs> gave my wife some time to cool off so she didn't kill me. But by the way, she's here, so <laughs> you can all uh, tell her what a saint she is after the program. But I actually climbed back up here on the cargo deck and just uh, put some mats out and just hung out there mm -hmm. and uh, finished reading my Clive Cussler book the entire way back. And the, the last experience I had was when we were coming in for landing in Christ Church and I made it back down to my seat. All the ice that had accumulated on all the control lines up here as we're coming back through and we're warming up. Coming back in on approach has, was breaking loose. So there's just pieces of ice <laughs> falling out of the ceiling and, and cold water dripping down my back. And I thought, well... All right, <laughs> take that. Yeah. Was it that loud, and did they provide those earmuffs? Um, no, they did not provide those earmuffs, and yes, it was that loud. <laughs> um, so I think I just had some headphones on, um, which I made sure to delete any Jimmy Buffett albums I had on my on my uh, iPods. I just didn't feel right listening to that in, uh, in Antarctica. Were there any women on board? The yeah, there, yeah, there were women down there. I'm not sure if there were any actually on our flight. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. <laughs> but yeah, no, there, there, there were a fair amount of women down there, both, both on staff and, and they're doing, doing research. But I can't remember if there were any actually on our flight or not. Because you can see there, there's a mix of uh, U.S. Antarctic folks and the red coats, and then the, the New Zealand folks had uh, black and orange. So we were able to color designate them. <laughs> this is the last picture that I'm going to show you. It, it's a simple, it's a simple picture, but when you put it in perspective, that there are billions of people on planet Earth, and every year only a few thousand people get to set foot on Antarctica. It's pretty special. And I was one of those people. And what makes it real special is if you back up 38 years from now and you hear the doctor tell that young couple in Greene County, Pennsylvania, that their son is never going to walk because his right foot is pointed 90 degrees the wrong way. This picture is very special to me. And what I want to leave you with is that if you're willing to put in the work and believe that you have faith, hope, and love, to make something that is seemingly impossible happen, I challenge you to remember this picture and make that happen. Thank you.